Hello everyone, I am Shobha from CNS and I welcome all of you. Today is World Health Day. Now this webinar is co-hosted by Population Reference Bureau, Helpage International, APCAT, which is Asia Pacific City Alliance for Tobacco Control and NCDs Prevention, APCAT Media, which is Asia Pacific Media Network to NTB and Tobacco and Prevent NCDs, Afghanistan NCD Alliance, Sustainable Development ETOX of Indian Institute of Management Indore and CNS. For the benefit of our audience, this webinar is being streamed live on the Facebook page of CNS. In all humility, we dedicate this webinar to the memory of Gita Ramji, whom all of you must be knowing was an eminent scientist and researcher based in South Africa who died of COVID-19 related complications on 31st of March. And we also remember now all those who have lost their lives to this disease. As per latest reports, the total number of people with confirmed coronavirus disease is more than 1.3 million. And the death toll has crossed the 74,000 mark. It's almost nearing 75,000. COVID-19 has severely impacted health security globally. And it is also a testing time for social security. Let us now hear more from our esteemed panelists. We are really fortunate to have with us today Dr. Tripti Gilada Baheti, an infectious disease expert from Unison Medicare and Research Center, India. Uh, Tripti is also actively associated with People's Health Organization, which completes 38 years of its existence today. Then we have with us Dr. Tara Singh Baum, who is Deputy Director for the Asia Pacific Region at the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease. We also have Dr. Jamil Zamir, who is Director of Programs at International Plant Parenthood Federation, or IPPF for East, Southeast Asia and Oceania region. He has over 21 years of experience in family planning and sexual and reproductive health programming in South Asian countries. And as he said himself earlier, he was based in Delhi for several years. We also have Chu Vietnam, who is program manager at Helpage International in Vietnam. And her work focuses on promoting overall well-being of older people through community-oriented intergeneration self-help clubs. A very warm welcome to each one of you. I would first like to invite our infectious diseases expert, Dr. Tripti Gilada Baheti from Unison Medicare and Research Center, India. Tripti, can you please give us an overview of the situation? Hello, everyone. Hello. I, hope, I, I hope most of you are at home keeping safe. Yes, uh, all of us are housebound. Yes, yes, yes yeah. So uh, it's it's a great day today, uh, the World Health Day, to actually sit and see what we have achieved and where we are. And, uh, you know, in midst of this entire epidemic, it's such a reminder that uh, the goal that we still remain to yet achieve, the, the health for all goal, something that we strive for day in, day out and year after year, uh, it's just a reminder how essential it is, you know. With COVID-19, we see that it has actually crossed all boundaries, not just international, but social boundaries, economic boundaries. There is no religious boundary, nothing at all. And, you know, uh, countries that we thought would uh, be safer are also the countries that are being worst affected. But we also know at this time that the countries that will be the most vulnerable in the times to come will be countries that haven't invested enough in their healthcare systems. Uh, and the other thing about COVID-19 is it's actually reminding us of all the basics. If you see, we always learned right from school times, we were always taught prevention is better than cure. But uh, as healthcare systems evolve and uh, as these systems get established in several countries, we know, I mean, one uh, being from India, we understand that even though people know what preventive health is, um, there isn't enough investment in preventive health 
both at the national state level but even at but even in our personal lives so preventive health is such a neglected field and if you see all the preventive strategies for covid-19 are absolute basic preventive strategies made be hand hygiene made be cough etiquette made be general hygiene at home and at work but something that we really did not take care about is now coming back to us so uh, just to give you an overview uh, i know that a lot of you are from uh, places other than india so india is just about um, entering its graph if you've known the graph of the epidemic we've just about entering the graph we have definitely moved from the stage 2 to the stage 3 of the epidemic by stage 3 of the epidemic is that our epidemic no more lies only in international travelers or their contacts but has now moved to the communities which means that each of us will really have to take a very active role and a very uh, careful role in uh, preventing the ongoing transmission of this disease uh, having said that we also know that there were a few steps that india did take pretty much early on while we were still in stage 2 one of them was locking our international boundaries and the second was the lockdown that we've been observing nationally and uh, we aren't sure uh, how far these effects go but we are really hoping that it is going to help us flatten the epidemic uh, this is also the time to realize that it's not just the poor who are going to be susceptible it's everyone across socio economic classes but while this epidemic has evolved the one class that we know has turned out most vulnerable is the senior citizens so people above the age of 60 and this is the time that we are really calling on to everyone to make sure that they protect their senior citizens and when i say protect their senior citizens these are absolute basic things we've been appealing to the people that uh, please help your senior citizens not step out of their house keep them in one place as isolated as possible from the outside world they really don't need to get out into public spaces and everything that they need needs to be provided to them while we move through this epidemic slowly at the same time we also know that when these senior citizens actually get to the hospital the rate of complications and the mortality that we see is much higher than what we've seen in the uh, younger population so these is this is also the population where we will really have to watch out even when they get a cough or fever and just something that might seem very mild we will just have to look out for them and watch out for them and see how they are improving or deteriorating so that we take early steps early on and um and then i mean these are the basics is the hand hygiene and the cough etiquettes and the social distancing uh we understand that just the the social distancing will not end as soon as the lockdown gets over the social distancing strategy is something that we will have to follow for several months to come and uh, it's going to be in different intensities in different places in places where there is a lot of ongoing community transmission we understand that each one will have to be responsible enough to not participate in large public events whether it's parties clubs marriages religious events uh, where wherever there are too many people together and at the same time Uh, we understand that this lockdown is really having a lot of economic impact and the uh, socio economically uh, already the, the the class which is already deprived of uh, their socio economic needs is actually going to face a further problem so this is also the time where we will really have to hold hands and make sure that we all move together um i will be available for questions at the end of the session but if there's something that uh shobha ji would like me to address at this point in time please let me know he wants to know what is the window period of infection the time between infection and detectable disease so at this point in time we know that uh the detection of disease so there are two things there is an incubation period where it's the time of entry of the virus into your body hmm. to the first sign or symptom and that can range anything from 1 to 14 days but the other thing is the entry of the virus to your body to the first positive test and uh, we know that the pcr test which is the gold standard test is positive maybe on day 2 or day 3 but that also depends on what the viral load shedding of the person is uh what is more important to understand is 
and that is something that's really coming out more and more over the last one week is that there is more and more and more evidence that it's not just symptomatic people who are transmitting the disease there are a lot of asymptomatic people or pre symptomatic people so people who've just not started getting the fever and cough who might be transmitting the disease and uh, because this fact was coming out so clearly in lot of studies across different countries that's the reason why both cdc and the ministry of health and family welfare have gone on to advise that when you step out in public places make sure everyone is wearing a cloth mask okay uh, then he wants to know what is the average period of infectiousness uh, the average period of infectiousness has changed from people who who been symptomatic to uh, symptoms to being asymptomatic and at some point we thought that once the patient was fine and was asymptomatic in 3 days they were actually not shedding any virus but we have seen a lot of studies where there has been viral shedding even weeks after the person has recovered and that's the reason why uh, social distancing is really really important whether a person is symptomatic asymptomatic has recovered for, from illness all right thank you i think for the time being that's enough and then we'll revert back to you with more questions sure Sophie. sure thank you very much and uh, let us now listen to this video message of laura vidin who is associate vice president at population reference bureau good morning my name is laura vidin i'm associate vice president of international programs at population reference bureau i'm so sorry that i couldn't join you in person this morning um, but i'm very pleased to bring warm greetings from washington dc I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Tripti Galati Bahetti, uh, Dr. Tara Singh Bam, and Dr. Jamil Zamir for joining us for this very important conversation on World Health Day. Non-communicable diseases don't usually grab headlines, but they're in, but they're in a vitally important indicator in the overall health of a country, and they are the leading cause of death in the world, including in most countries in Asia. People with underlying chronic Uh, conditions such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, chronic respiratory diseases are particularly at risk of infection as the global community grapples with the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the past 7 years, uh, PRB has partnered with AstraZeneca's Young Health program to encourage policymakers and decision makers to address the growing challenge of non-communicable diseases in low and middle income countries. in particular by tackling key behavioral risk factors among youth. Most recently in February 2020, we hosted a training uh, at the Global NCD Alliance Forum in the United Arab Emirates for journalists on the vital role that media plays in reporting on risk factors and prevention of non-communicable diseases among youth. That's why we're very pleased today to join with Citizen News Service, HelpAge International, APCAT Abcat Media, Afghanistan NCD Alliance, IAM Endure to host today's discussion. Timely, accurate reporting on the threat that non-communicable diseases present, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, is vitally important. We hope we will leave today's discussion with the information you need to help curb the epidemic across Asia and to contribute to the long-term well-being of your communities. thank you for joining us and we wish you a very very productive meeting thank you thank you laura a very long distance thank you our next speaker is dr tara singh bam deputy regional director of the asia pacific region at the international union against tuberculosis and lung disease dr bam is currently based in singapore and has been doing commendable work in the field of ncd prevention and tobacco control and other public health programs for several years uh, dr baum can you please share your insights uh, in relation to the current pandemic uh, thank you uh, shobha and the whole cns team for uh, organizing this very important uh, uh, webinar uh, and as, uh, as uh, dr lara previously mentioned uh, that the uh, ncd is you know hardly uh, is, uh, we, we see in a, as a, as a headline countries whether it's in developed countries or developing countries so similarly the the risk factor uh, to the uh, uh, ncds so for example tobacco tobacco alcohol and other the sugar these are the risk factors main risk factors also have we see as a 
safety uh, in the program uh, to control the so but, uh, the uh, but now what is happening the, this uh, covid 19 uh, that is yeah, that really uh, actually uh, one uh, or the uh, uh, keep to everyone oh there is a need of better health system there is a need of the, uh, the uh, uh, creating a uh, uh, health system uh, the, the strengthening of the environment we need a better uh, the the better position of the, our policies programs and also at the same time there is a need of to to eliminate i like to use the word eliminate to eliminate all the distractors such as tobacco uh, in this context uh, the previous speaker already highlighted the, the pandemic of covid 19 i would just like to also add here is uh, we could only see the people who are in the older pre existing non communicable disease conditions so are more vulnerable up to, to the covid 19 uh, and the the lara the lara already highlighted uh, these uh, ncds includes uh, cardiovascular disease diabetes cancer and other chronic respiratory diseases as well so for all of these uh, the ncds tobacco use is a major risk factor that we, we noticed for a range of uh, the you know the, uh, the ncds uh, so uh, we also uh, see uh, the, the, the whatever the data available till now uh, the, uh, the smoker uh, or tobacco user are more likely to be affected by COVID-19 and also experience the worst outcome as compared to non-smoker. The study from China has, uh, also shows that uh, it's, uh, the smoker is 14 times more uh, likely to uh, be affected by COVID-19. So it's, uh, it's, it clearly it shows there is a need of uh, the tobacco control there is a need of better NCD prevention and program uh, uh, the, in at, uh, any level, whether the national or national level. So, the, uh, uh, in conclusion, I would like to say tobacco is now seen as a major risk factor, uh, uh, not only for the NCD, but also for any uh, the pandemic of COVID-19. So, uh, I I would say here is an opportunity also for, uh, for all of us working in. Uh, Health sector and health and development to uh, to uh, re, uh, re evaluate our strategies to uh, uh, revisit our policies and programs. So, the uh, uh, one of the things that we would uh, how can we do this is uh, we need to work uh, together uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a media, uh, as a, a politician, as a member of parliament, or as a you know, the executives or the public and community it's a time to work together it's a time to have the better uh, the, the, the can, program can i interrupt can i interrupt a little bit uh, uh, tara we can't hear the voice is breaking maybe it is some internet problem at your end but please continue but the in between the voice is breaking but sorry for that interruption but please continue uh, can, can you hear me uh, i don't know what happened the... no, no this was better no, okay, thank you. So uh, that's why I'm also starting. I'm also starting to hear from from South Africa. Yes. Okay, thank you. So Tara, can you please repeat a little bit of what you have said already? Because now you are very clear. Uh, the, the, what I am uh, uh, trying to say here is the tobacco yes. to, uh, is a, one of the major risk factors that we have noticed. Uh, the, as for the, the evidence that so far we have for uh, the COVID nineteen as well. So it's a it's the tobacco smoking become a really one the hot issue uh, in a, in a global public health arena now. So the, we uh, uh, the, the pandemic like the COVID nineteen and also at the same time the pandemic uh, the the tobacco uh, because of the tobacco also we have another pandemic. So the, it's a is now the two pandemics you know the the tobacco pandemic is really uh, the uh, accelerating the uh, the the pandemic. COVID-19 as well. So it's a, uh, I would like, you know, the, 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 all of you guys, and also the politician. Uh, again, the, it's breaking. Again, the voice is breaking. In between, yeah, it was to, very clear. Yes, now it's clear. To, yes. to, to revisit the our uh, health programs, 
uh, the policies, the legislation, the strategies to really uh, integrate us, the, the system of one health. So it's a, when I said one health, it means it's a time to uh, have the, uh, the, the effective health system in place, whether at the, uh, at the tertiary level or the secondary level or even in the primary level. So the, how we, it is possible to make uh, uh, the, the, the one health system uh, the, uh, at any levels if we work together. So, so there are many, the, the stakeholders can play a greater role in this part. Uh, the, for example, the, uh, the city government, the subnational government, mayor, the governor can play a bigger role that we have seen now in, you know, even, uh, in addressing the pandemic globally. The governors, however, the players, they are really putting all the effort uh, to uh, address this issue. So uh, my, uh, the, the second part uh, is the media also that can play a bigger role to spread the information, uh, to make the governments accountable, and to hold the governments to continue their, uh, their regular primary health care services. For example, the, there should be no any interruption of the, uh, uh, TB medicine for the uh, tuberculosis patient, and the, the children should get the regular immunizations. Uh, the people with the NCD on a regular basis. So the, it, it is also the, we need to uh, the, need the media, the, uh, the support to, to, uh, to, to build the such uh, the, uh, those you know, the, 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 uh, awareness to the policymaker as well. Uh, at the same time, so the, the member of parliament at the national level, whether they are not sub-national level, also uh, make the governments more accountable. So they can also provide some support to, uh, to allocate more resources. And, uh, the member of parliaments also can play bigger roles to uh, identify uh, and then link uh, both national and international partners as well. So in this context, uh, the, so far, uh, again, the, the learning from the, the Singapore, uh, uh, you know, the, the government is very serious. Government make uh, assure to all to the people that uh, their government is serious. Government has resources. They have better health system, and uh, they can uh, they, they can really the COVID nineteen. So uh, I think there is a time to be united and to make our own voice and one health, and also the, it's a time to make our commitment uh, to. Eliminate the, the risk factors uh, the, like such as tobacco, alcohol uh, from our community to prevent any pandemic in the future. Over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Tara. Uh, we, you have done a lot of work on the importance of local action, mobilizing mayors and governors. And we already have a few questions there, uh, which perhaps you can take up right now and then we'll go back to the questions later on also as they keep on coming. Uh, so we have Upinder Gill uh, from India who wants no, to know uh, what is the role of municipal authorities uh, in this case and how can civil society be of support to the government systems? Uh, the, uh, the role of the, uh, the local governments uh, is, a, uh, is a very critical uh, because uh, they know that their local primary healthcare system, they know their the primary uh, the, the health system in place. Uh, so they know the people, they know the all the things because the local leaders are really in a good position to understand the, the whole environment. So we, we as a union and Asia Pacific Cities Alliance and that media and parliamentarians, we develop uh, the toolkits and, uh, and share with the, uh, almost all the mayors uh, in Asia Pacific, uh, Pacific regions and, and also we share this uh, uh, policy uh, information to the different uh, the, uh, uh, civil society organizations. Uh, the, especially the, the, uh, to the point that question is the, uh, the, the local the, the governments can allocate uh, enough resources uh, they can link the uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the people with the, and also the uh, the media the, the, and other civil society to uh, to build the public awareness on COVID nineteen. Uh, they can facilitate uh, the, uh, the uh, facilitate the you know, like diagnostic laboratory part. Even the, the 
treatment of the symptoms with the uh, tertiary care level, that will be the national governments. So the, the sub-national governments is a key now to, to, to solve the issue locally. Uh, at the same time, the civil society can play a really, really critical role uh, as, as a watchdog and as a facilitator to so, uh, make the governments uh, accountable. Uh, why I'm saying this? You know, uh, uh, yes, uh, we have to. Uh, the, we have to fight. We have to fight with pandemic. But at the same time, the the, the, the governments make sure that the regular primary health care uh, uh, run uh, smoothly without any interruption. So the uh, uh, I think that is a critical part where civil society can play a bigger role. Okay, uh, we have a question from Dr. Rakesh Gupta from Chandigarh, India. Uh, he wants to know what would be the recommendation of the experts regarding uh, use of pan masala uh, or tobacco use in any other form, including hookah, electronic cigarettes, in the prevention and management of COVID-19 uh, in view of recent studies. Uh, I, I think uh, yes. uh, this is this is really the, the good question. I think I would say the, the first, the first uh, now is a time to encourage our governments to completely ban all types of tobacco, including the, the hookah, or whether it's a, the chewing tobacco or uh, the, the uh, vaping, e-cigarette, everything. I say, I, uh, for example, sir, the, the Nepal, the, the, the Ministry of Health here, uh, is going to issue uh, the, the notification to ban all these product, pro products completely. And also creating uh, uh, the uh, smoke-free environment in all public places and overseas. I, I, I think this is a really good opportunity to eliminate the tobacco pandemic. And uh, of course, there have been news that in Italy, even during the lockdown, uh, perhaps the tobacco shops were open and vaping shops uh, remained open. So I, I really do not know how much that contributed to the to the fatalities there, but uh, that is one point uh, which I thought uh, maybe the, it, the context is different there. So I don't want to uh, give my opinion there at all. Uh, there's one more question which has come as of now for Tara. Uh, Sahil from Operation Asha wants to know any specific recommendations for TB patients? They are, uh, are they more vulnerable to COVID-19? And they, many of them stay in slums and uh, uh, urban slums and in villages where social distancing is not that easy. In fact, it's next to impossible in certain cases. Yeah, that is the, the key thing. Yeah, we have to really pay attention. Uh, uh, both are the, you know, the COVID-19 uh, also primarily attacks to lungs and airways. Uh, and also the TB is a lung disease as well. So uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think we need to really uh, uh, the, the pay attention to our regular health services as well. The TB patients should get their tuberculosis medicines on a regular basis. There should be no any interruption at all. Uh, that, uh, in that case, we, we need to really make sure that uh, the, uh, the TB pay, the governments should provide those services on a regular basis. The second point is, uh, if possible, you know, the, the symptoms are similar, like, uh, for example, fever and cough. So they are, uh, if possible, yeah, they are, uh, you know, the TB patients uh, can also uh, uh, test it for COVID-19. But uh, they, uh, again, the, yeah, there are some certain things that we, we have to accommodate as for the local settings uh, and environment. But again, the social distancing, not only for the, the, uh, the COVID-19, but also for TB as well. Uh, thank you, Tara. We'll have more questions later on as they come in. Uh, I now invite Dr. Jamil Zamir, Director of Programs at International Plant Parenthood Federation for East, Southeast Asia and Oceania region. And he's based in Malaysia. Over to you, Jamil. Uh Thank you, uh, thank you very much for um, uh, for inviting me to join this uh, panel. And uh, uh, I just want to uh, 
thank the Tripti, uh, Laura, and Dr. Baum to really uh, giving a kind of uh, a background, basic and essential information about COVID. Uh, as I'll be talking basically on how COVID has uh, uh, affected SRHR, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and how IPPF is uh, responding to that. So uh, to begin with, I would say that it is a most noble recognition of the work of nurse and midwives who are at the forefront of COVID-19 response. And uh, there's a huge responsibility for all the stakeholders to ensure that service providers' needs and rights are adequately addressed. This is something we have always find it quite challenging in, in Asia and East Asia. Uh, just to give a big a bit background of what IPPF is, IPPF is a global service provider and the leading advocate for sexual and reproductive health and rights. And there are a lot of resources and uh, frequently asked questions and answers on the on our website and other resources. Uh, we we delivered uh, last year 251 million services through over 50,000 service delivery points, and um, so that's that's our core business. Uh, and one of the biggest impact of COVID-19 is that it has profoundly impacted on the access to family planning information and services and sexual and reproductive health and rights. And I really want to get back to some of the very basic things related to uh, healthcare systems. If you look at it uh, with COVID-19, there has always been a kind of challenge in terms of uh, essential SRH commodities and it has increased hugely. Uh, uh, because we already know that there's a high enmity to family planning, the contraceptives, abortion pills, and reproductive health commodities. Uh, is actually, there's shortage due to the disruption in the supply chain. And most of these drug manufacturing plants are located either in India and China and some other countries where it's really stuck and the closure of ports. We have also seen that uh, there's shortage of service providers who are providing SRHR services and some of the service providers are called to the front line to help address the epidemic. Uh, as you must be hearing already that uh, the violence against women is highly prevalent. We already know that one in three women worldwide experience physical and sexual violence by intimate partner. and now we are getting solid evidences that there's a spike in, in the GBV during a pandemic. And the evidence shows that for many women, uh, uh, the home is not the same uh, safe place. And so it's one of the areas of concern uh, as we are looking at uh, the responses to this. Also another area which is equally important is uh, safe abortion. We know that's already restricted by uh, law and over half of the unwanted pregnancies end in abortion. Globally, about 56 million abortion takes place each year. So you can see the the, the volume and and with the uh, health system limitations that are coming in, uh, it has become more profound. Also, there is concern that the response may take away funds from SRH uh, uh, programs. So I was really happy today to hear from WHO webinar that uh, WHO has identified is it as a essential uh, services because in some of the countries, SRHR actually has moved as a non-essential services. And our member associations are educating for bringing it back as, as essential services. And uh, WHO is going to come up also with a brief to support uh, this advocacy effort. Within IPPF, uh, we have constituted a task force for a coordinated response to COVID-19. Uh, we just concluded a global survey of 121 countries and what it has shown that there's a decrease in service delivery points, which means closure, decrease in SRS services provided and commodity shortage. And it is significant, almost uh, one fourth of the service uh, uh, delivery points are being affected. So there are four messages 
uh, where our member associations, national organizations will be working on. Uh, one is to strengthen community education and awareness around uh, COVID-19. Second is to ensure continuity of essential SRS services. Third one is to look at security of essential SRH commodities and supplies. And the fourth one is to ensure the safety of service providers and clients. What we have now witnessed is that our member associations have adapted to this extremely challenging situation and they are moving towards modernizing and digitizing the services. Uh, some of our member associations who have been working around these lines on reaching out through telemedicine and telemedicine has emerged as one of the very important interventions uh, because of the uh, lockdowns and the restriction of movements. So we have example from Philippines, Australia, China, New Zealand, that they are providing it through telemedicine. We also have examples uh, on clinical consultation through uh, telemedicine. Our member association, for example, in Malaysia is offering home delivery of uh, SRH commodities such as contraceptives and pregnancy kits. And then initially when this COVID started, uh, mask uh, uh, to China and other products and uh, now China actually is returning a favor. So I just want to say that we are locally owned and globally connected. So these are some of the uh, uh, ways we are looking at to uh, address uh, um, SRH issues in this uh, pandemic and I, I'm sure that many organizations are coming forward to bring SRH as, as a essential service within the a public health system. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Dr. Jamil. You have really uh, pinpointed uh, the great malaise which faces SRH services. And uh, with uh, COVID-19, in fact, all other basic health services have really come to a sort of a stop now. And uh, say for abortion, even if it, where it, in countries where it is legal, one has to go to a health uh, facility. And uh, if the movement is restricted and uh, they, in fact, OPDs have been closed in most of the hospitals, at least in India. So, because the whole attention is, and rightly so, of course, uh, on COVID-19 patients, but uh, other things are being discounted. And this may have serious repercussions in the long run, as you said. I had also heard that uh, a condo manufacturing plant in uh, Malaysia has closed down. And we are, feed, we are uh, foreseeing an acute shortage of condoms in the near future, perhaps. Am I right there? Yes, yes. And, and uh, the shortage is across, I mean, I can yes. tell you across 25 countries in Eastern Pacific region, there's a huge shortage. And to get clearance from the, uh, from the release of consignments to sending the consignment is a huge challenge. So uh, it has to be in country and, and these are, there are supply challenges, see the supply challenges. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, last but not the least, we have Chu Vietnam, who is Program Manager at Helpage International in Vietnam. Uh, Na, uh, hello and welcome to you. Uh, in 2016, I had the opportunity of attending a monthly meeting of what they call intergeneration self-help clubs in Vietnam. They have lot many clubs. And I attended a meeting at Lu Ha Village in Hanoi and was really impressed by the work they were doing for the elderly at community level. Uh, Dr. Trupti Gilada has also mentioned that uh, the elderly are at greater risk, uh, need more protection. Of course, I think all of us are at the same risk of getting the infection. But once the infection is inside the body, then uh, different human bodies are dis responding in a different way. So now, will you please share with us how these clubs are looking after the health needs of older people in the community in these times of COVID-19? Thank you, Shopa, for introducing me. Yes. So I will share my screen. Yes. So thank you to the organizing team for putting together this webinar and for inviting me for sharing. 
So my name is Nga. I'm working for Health Edge International in Vietnam, an NGO focusing on the well-being of older people. And for today, I would like to focus on three main points. The first is I will give you a quick overview of the COVID-19 situation in Vietnam so that you have a background understanding of our intervention. Secondly, uh, I will talk about the position of older people in this um, pandemic. How are they affected, but also at the same time can be the resources. And lastly, I will introduce uh, about the community-based approach that could be uh, that is uh, currently one part of the solution to tackle this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So to start off with the overview, um, Vietnam is located in the Southeast um, Asia, one of the first areas affected by the virus. And we had our first case in late January. And so far we have about, uh, until today, we have 245 positive cases and about uh, nearly 4,000 people under suspicious of uh, affecting the, the virus and uh, 75,000 in quarantine at the moment. So Vietnam government take the pandemic very seriously and uh, the government and the community have uh, begun lots of intervention at early stage uh, since uh, the late January already. And about um, mostly of our cases, 60% uh, of the infected cases are from uh, people coming back from uh, foreign countries, uh, back to the country. So that is the overview and brings me to the second point, the position of older people. So um, in Vietnam, the number of older people with uh, positive cases is not that, uh, um, is not more comparing to other age groups. This is because uh, we applied the uh, social isolation at a very early stage and uh, the government issued uh, lots of awareness raising on the uh, vulnerability of older people in this disease. Uh, however, uh, even though the number is not that high comparing to other age groups, uh, when older people are infected, they are definitely more severely affected. And uh, uh, also uh, because uh, more older people have NCD, uh, weaker health, uh, slower access to information, um, also the social isolation and the stopping of uh, several uh, social services uh, making older people's life definitely more difficult. And at the same time, um, the um, recovery of older people when we uh, overcome this uh, pandemic, maybe it will, be, it will be also harder for older people to overcome because of, the, uh, uh, the, of their income are affected and also many other social aspects. Uh, still, at the same time, older people is uh, a group of great diversity and um, when we look at this age group, we look at their vulnerability but also their ability to contribute, how they can uh, be part of the solution, how they can take care of themselves if they are provided with the skill and the knowledge and not only taking care of themselves to protect them against this virus, but also protect their family members, other older people in the community um, and their neighborhood. Um, and uh, also uh, the um, uh, following uh, the main points, I would, I would also show you some pictures, some real life pictures of older people contributing and participating in the uh, fight against this virus. The last point I want to share is about the community-based care approach, uh, uh, care and health services. So in, in, in Vietnam, we have this model called Intergenerational Self-Help Club, uh, ISHC for short. In other countries, there are similar models, but with different names, but the community-based uh, natures remain the same. So this is a quick uh, picture of the... Uh, ISHC activities. You do not have to read the, the, all the words in the slide. Uh, I just want to give a quick summary that the ISHC is a multifunctional model. And it's um, not only uh, because at Help Edge, we are focusing on the well-being of older people. So the club will have a diversity of activities. 
uh, and also in order to support uh, older people to overcome the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we do not just need uh, health services and health support, but also other support like income support and living support, many. Uh, but for this um, sharing, because of the time and the skill, I will uh, uh, put a little bit more priority in the health and care services that the club provide, which uh, leads to this slide. So the uh, ISHC provides four types of care, uh, psychology, psychosocial care, personal care, living support care, and uh, part of the medical and treatment. For the uh, uh, social care, this is very important for older people, especially in terms of um, social isolation. Um, because if you are not well, if you're not healthy mentally, uh, it's, uh, you, uh, you are not healthy physically as well. So the club will provide um, social care uh, for older people, you know, making sure that they are feeling okay during this, um, uh, this, this, this uh, pandemic, uh, that they receive the mental support, that they can connect with friends and families and peers uh, to, to get updates on what's happening and, and how they can be supported and um, so that they do not have to go through the, uh, so that it is only physical isolation, but not, you know, social isolation with the with others. Uh, secondly, in terms of uh, personal care, the um, uh, not, uh, I, have, I have to highlight that not all older people need personal care. Uh, only a part of uh, older people need personal care, but uh, in this group, the ISHC, they provide volunteers and assistance to come and support with like uh, cooking or going shopping or helping with the, uh, taking the medicine because they cannot get out of the house anymore. Uh, or for some severe cases, providing um, um, ADL care for, for older people, uh, for, all, for those who need feeding or transferring, uh, things like that. And uh, thirdly, for the living support care, uh, because uh, many, uh, uh, many sectors are now closed and apart, a huge group of older people working in the informal sector. So that means their livelihood are affected. So the IHSC also mobilized resources to provide cash support or rice or necessities like the face mask or soap to wash your hands, um, especially during this um, pandemic. And lastly, the medical care. So the club can provide information on the COVID-19, the virus, uh, what are the measures to protect yourself against a virus, and also uh, providing referral care if uh, any cases become more uh, severe. Uh, so that is the four types of care that the club provide to older people and the community uh, in general. Um, during um, during this period, and now I will move on to some uh, pictures uh, to uh, demonstrate. Um, uh, these pictures were taken at different different time. Some were taken at the very earlier stage of the pandemic in uh, uh, February. So you will at that point, uh, Vietnam didn't apply the national social isolation yet. Um, so these uh, photos are actually from different time timeline. So the uh, first, uh, I'd like to show you that, how we can uh, equip older people with the knowledge and the skill. So our Ministry of Health, they have messages for the general public on how you can protect yourself by washing the hands and not uh, getting into contact uh, in uh, two meters with other people and things like that. Uh, what the club do is that the club help to transfer this skill and knowledge to older people in the community, you know, uh, through uh, giving out uh, leaflets. Um, uh, you can see in the first picture, they are giving out phone calls. Um, or the, uh, this uh, third picture, they are setting up online groups um, that older people who have the phones, uh, they can get access to these online groups. Or uh, the fifth picture, which is the uh, loudspeaker, and they broadcast the, um, the knowledge and the skill of the COVID-19 on loudspeakers so that the older people can listen to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to such information and, and prepare themselves. 
and also increase raise the awareness of the community uh, on this uh, disease. And um, next is uh, how old people they can be the example of the community. Like for this, uh, we call it the intergenerational approach because in the um, club, it is not only older people, but also other age groups. And uh, they, what they do is they can interact with each other and older people, they can set example in their family, uh, how to, uh, for, like, for, for smaller children, like how to take care of, your, of themselves and how to wash their hands as the picture that you can see here. And also it uh, increases the awareness that uh, for younger generations, they understand that even though maybe their immune system is stronger and they are maybe less likely to be affected uh, that severely because of the virus, but they can uh, but they can affect other senior members of the society, of, of the family. So the intergenerational approach is very important. It brings uh, generations, age groups together uh, to, to solve uh, the, the problem. Uh, next, I have some pictures of the club preparing the uh, cleaning liquid to give to the community to uh, clean their house and the public services. And uh, these uh, liquids were made with the, under the instruction of lo local medical staff. And uh, also they will, um, for those who, they have a checkpoint that people can come and take. But for those who are homebound and bedbound, then the club will volunteer to deliver this uh, to, the, to the home of older people. And also this is a way of uh, at the same time providing uh, knowledge and skill about the disease and uh, giving encouragement and uh, support uh, during this um, period. And uh, for those who are um, more, uh, who, who health are weaker and need more intensive care, then the club have a group of volunteers. Uh, these volunteers, they come and uh, they provide uh, care services at home of older people and other disadvantaged groups. And this is a, a, service, a service that the club already provide even before the COVID-19. Uh, but during COVID-19, they will change it around a little bit. Like you see how the volunteers are wearing face masks and, and gloves. And they are making sure that the, uh, uh, the beneficiaries, they have the enough medicine because they now they cannot come to the medical center to get the medicine anymore. So the volunteers will come and get for them and make sure that they have enough medicine for their ongoing um, non-communicable disease like hypertension. They need to take the medicine uh, you know, daily. And uh, also at the same time, the volunteers provide knowledge on the uh, pandemic and update the situation for these uh, uh, group. And uh, the volunteers also have to go shopping and they uh, buy the food and they leave it out at the door so that the uh, people can um, take uh, at their home, these, uh, take from their home, not uh, risking expose themselves to go out to the market. And uh, the club also mobilized resources, like they're giving the necessity kit including um, soap to wash the hands and face mask and, and food to give out to the most vulnerable uh, people of the community. And the point is that uh, this club is uh, village based so that uh, it can help with identifying who are the most uh, needed in terms of uh, support because uh, we have limited support. So we have to uh, prioritize those who are more vulnerable first and the club can help to identify these uh, people. Uh, this is the club giving uh, the necessities to a uh, uh, fisherman because uh, they live uh, near the water area and they are the most uh, um, uh, vulnerable when it comes to information access. So the club also reach out to those groups and making sure that uh, no one is living behind in this pandemic. And also giving rice and uh, washing uh, soap, hand wash soap to the community. And uh, these are some uh, pictures of the club uh, participating in the local authorities meeting about the response to the COVID-19. So um, with this, uh, they will be informed better and they can be um, mobilized um, for, the, for the response to the, to, to the pandemic. Some uh, 
in the picture so they can see some pictures of the people volunteering to help during the pandemic by getting information of the uh, history of the travel or taking the um, taking the temperature at some uh, public places or donating cash to the government in uh, to respond to the to the disease I'll have a cleaning the local community uh, spreading out the or as simply as they have to make a food for the doctor and nurses and government officials who are working at night shift uh, during the, the response. So uh, my conclusion of this is that um, it's the same thing like you prepare for climate change. Um, you have to prepare, you have to increase the resilient. And these uh, community-based approach like the ISHC, they are part of the prepared needs. So that when something as sudden and as um, um, severe as COVID-19 strike the community, the community, they are prepared. They have the existing foundation to alert the local people and they can provide the support to other people uh, within uh, uh, the, in, 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 short, in short term and they just provide the services locally. And uh, this is part of the solution. Um, the, we still need the national uh, intervention, uh, need the, we can rely on the direction from the government and the Ministry of Health and uh, stakeholders. But um, these uh, community-based organizations, they will help to deliver such national programs and, and services uh, to the community and to reach out to the most uh, difficult uh, people in the community. And they will have to transfer the support at the national level to the community level um, uh, to, 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 uh, to support other people getting through this and uh, to make sure that nobody is uh, left out and involve actually uh, building capacity for the community to, uh, to work together with the government to tackle this um, issue together um, so that uh, we can overcome this uh, pandemic as a whole and, uh, uh, and to make sure that other people are not uh, discriminated or left out of, of, the, of the solution. Uh, so um, again, uh, we need to set up uh, these uh, community-based organizations uh, to act as a foundation, uh, to build capacity for the, the local community uh, to prepare ourselves for maybe uh, future uh, incidents like the COVID-19. So that is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, if you have, it is my contact. If you have any questions, I would love to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Na, and all force to you for the commendable work you all are doing and just shows how important local action is uh, always, particularly in times of crisis like this. Uh, I now invite the listeners for their comments and questions. If you are using the Zoom platform, please type in your questions and comment in the chat box or you raise your virtual hand and if you wish to speak, just unmute yourself and ask the question yourself. And if you're watching it on Facebook, you can leave a comment there. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Shakur from Afghanistan uh, to please share his insights. Dr. Shakur, if you are there still. Hello. Yes, hello. Um, thank you for uh, first. Thank you for all of the panelists. Thanks for their information they have shared and uh, uh, what they have shared, their advices and what they have done. Based on uh, as the Afghanistan NCD Alliance, uh, I have I want to just share the situation in Afghanistan. We have recently 423 cases in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, 14 deaths uh, from the coronavirus. One is the medical uh, staff which has died from the coronavirus and 15 people have been recovered. The main problem in our country is the lack of education and also lack of tests for the coronavirus. Also the economical situation and political situation. So therefore the media, as we all know, there is no medicine, no vaccine for this disease. 
So the main focus of Ministry of Health, uh, Public Health and the donors also of the civil society is to focus on the preventive measures and uh, raise awareness of the people to have to protect their self by washing their hands and um, uh, to prevent the, uh, the social dance, the distances. So these are the things that we, uh, we are also engaged with uh, as we are doing with the non-communicable disease and the non-communicable disease, the people who are living with non-communicable disease are more vulnerable to the coronavirus because they have, uh, if you are, there is evidence which uh, people have the chronic diseases, they will have the severe disease from the coronavirus. So therefore, we are also working with the government to raise the awareness of people and focusing on their preventive uh, approach for the protection of people from this COVID-19. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. we have uh, Dr. Uh, Zamuruddin from Bhopal. Uh, if you are there, doctor, can you please share your insights? He is Dr. Jamil's father. So we have a very formidable duo here. Uh, if Dr. Zamiruddin is still there online, we would be happy if he could share his thoughts. All right. Meanwhile, while we wait for him, we have a question from Ajay Sakare, uh, who wants to know if there is any correlation of a rising temperature and COVID-19 or the coronavirus infection. Uh, would any of the panelists like to answer that? Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. Please, Trupti. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so since this is a new virus, we really don't know how it's going to behave. There is some speculation that with rising temperature and increasing humidity, the transmission might decrease. We hope that happens. But we will actually have to wait for an entire season to see if that really happens. So at this point in time, we aren't banking on any of these possibilities because uh, we'll just have to keep our efforts going. Okay. Uh, then we had another question from uh, uh, Dr. Bharadwaj who wanted to know, is reinfection possible with, uh, uh, with this virus? And so, can uh, Yes. So at this point in time, we don't have any evidence of reinfection as yet, but we also know that coronavirus is known to mutate in certain ways. So, you know, just like influenza virus, like influenza virus over a season, maybe it mutates a little bit uh, and therefore people become slightly more susceptible, uh, susceptible again. So just like we don't know how it behaves with temperature, we really don't know what happens with long-term immunity, but we really are hoping that one COVID-19 infection does give a long-term immunity to people okay what uh, not the are we talking of herd immunity there so so what herd immunity is a uh, herd you know once a, a viral infection or a bacterial infection gets a lifelong immunity what happens is with you know with more and more days and more and more weeks and months and years there will be more and more people who would have either had a asymptomatic infection and recovered or had a mild symptomatic infection and recovered. And since these people will become immune to that infection, that adds on to the herd immunity. But at this point in time, we really aren't banking on herd immunity yet. Right. Uh, anybody else who wants to ask a question? Anybody else from the audience who would like to ask themselves? Uh, we have... Uh, uh, questions from Noorul Islam Hasib, who is special correspondent uh, at Bangladesh Post. Uh, he says in Bangladesh cases are rising and so are the number of deaths. And many of those who died suffered from NCDs. Uh, NCD related diseases are big health issues and the trend is rising with the demographic change. Uh, tobacco use is also a big issue here. So what would be your suggestions for those who are suffering from NCDs? Uh, and he has one more part to the question that due to lockdown, people are staying at home and eating a lot of, uh, uh, eating a lot, at least what has been observed in urban Dhaka, perhaps that's the case elsewhere also. <laughs> Can the lockdown contribute to further rise of NCDs? 
Uh, and before Tripti, you can answer him. I would just like to thank Nurul because he had initially floated this idea of having a webinar on these issues. So uh, thanks to Nurul, and then we carried it forward. Uh, he is a founding member of the APCAT Media Network also. Uh, so yes, Tripti, now. So there are two issues with people who have uh, NCDs. Mm -hmm. The first issue is that we know that they are a vulnerable population. Mm -hmm. So uh, they are more likely to get a complicated infection or a severe COVID-19 infection if they really do get infected. We also know that people with uh, heart disease or uncontrolled diabetes uh, and, and a lot of these lifestyle diseases also have a higher mortality than the other people who do not have NCDs. So that's one aspect of increased morbidity and increased mortality in relation to COVID-19. The other problem that we are seeing with NCDs and the lockdown is that, that since the healthcare facilities are rather strained at this point, we know that the it's not just the people with COVID-19 who will reach the hospital and might, might not get great care, but it's also people with NCDs. So we really are urging people that at this point, this is not a great time to fall ill and it's not a great time to actually fall ill to the extent that you will need hospital care. So those with NCDs, please keep your sugars under control. Those with COPDs and are smoking, this is a great time to stop smoking. And, you know, as much as possible, make sure your diet and your lifestyle is healthy enough to not take you to the hospital, at least at this point in time. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, anyone else wants to ask the question, please ask yourself. Anybody? Uh, just unmute yourself and ask if anybody wants. We are already running short of time. Any more questions? There are some questions about, uh, are there chances of the virus to mutate so that it becomes less severe, le infects less? I mean, there are always these possibilities and we really don't know. There is al always a chance that the virus mutates and becomes more lethal. So, you know, these are just possibilities. And at this point in time, we have no evidence of any such thing happening. And when do you expect the peak to happen in India? Or when are we, when do you uh, the... You know, the next one month, uh, mm. especially because we know that the community transmission has started. Mm. So we know that the next one month is going to be really very crucial. Uh, it's also going to be crucial because a lot of states will be out of lockdown and people might be getting back to their routine lives again. So we will really have to strategize on how there is a graded release of lockdown and what are the precautions that people will still have to follow with social distancing and with all the measures that they have taken during lockdown, even if they have to get back to work. Okay, okay. I'm just looking at if there are any more questions. Mm. Uh, Muthoni wants to know if uh, a person living with NCD what should the person do in case they do get infected with COVID-19? So, Not in infected with the virus rather or COVID-19. COVID-19 <laughs> is the disease, of course, yes. Let's understand that even a person with MC NCD, mm -hmm. uh, in all possibilities, most people are going to get a mild infection and recover from a mild infection. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are also the people that we will have to watch out for complications. And the complications are going to be very, is like a viral pneumonia. So someone who really gets breathless, uh, gets very high grade fevers, persistent with a lot of cough or decreasing urine output, or there are some neurological changes. And these are the things that you will have to look out for in people with NCDs, because these will be indicators that now this person cannot be offered care at home and needs to go to the hospital. Okay. Uh, Dr. Baum, would you like to add something to that or say something? on how people with NCD should manage? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have any to add. Okay, Your, any special advice for people who are living with some NCD or the other? During yeah, 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 as a, as a doctor, uh, uh, 
already highlighted some points like uh, yeah, we need to maintain our uh, the, the healthy yes. diet and uh, the, you know the physical mm -hmm. exercise wherever possible mm -hmm. and it's a perfect time to quit uh, smoking and yes. to, you know, yes. prevent the people from second hand smoke mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. okay thank you uh, uh, we have uh, a question from rakoto manana uh, from madagascar uh, um, it is shared that madagascar has 85 cases one in critical situation and seven recovered by use of chloroquine is there any medicine uh, is there evidence that this medicine is useful there's a lot of talk about that trupti hydrochloroquine and we can't hear you please unmute yourself trupti um yes can you hear me now yes yes yeah. so i said there is there is only very anecdotal evidence at this point in time that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine might have effect on uh, covid 19 there are a lot of ongoing trials in this regard and we will only have the reports from these trials in the months to come but what is important to understand is that at this point in time where there isn't any specific treatment countries are going to take on to using any medication that might have any anecdotal benefit and which has no harm in that extent so you know uh, given the risk benefit ratio or the cost benefit ratio there's something inexpensive not with too many side effects there are going to be a lot of guidelines where they'll say in this scenario at least let's try using it and then we will see what the uh, clinical trial reports have to say once they are available okay Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Tara. Can you share with us any uh, uh, special steps the government can take to at least further ban tobacco use, keeping in mind the COVID epidemic? Maybe they are forced to take actions which they were earlier not very comfortable taking. So, uh, 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 you know, tobacco uh, smoking and the use of tobacco now seen as a major risk factor. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. to spread the COVID, mm -hmm. uh, and also people, uh, you know, they they uh, living with NCD, they are also vulnerable. So, I, at this moment, I think government has to uh, really uh, revisit their the tobacco control strategy to make the, the uh, you know their implementation of the tobacco control more effective. Uh, so I think it's a time to uh, to uh, to help the people to quit smoking, and also the, uh, the I would also uh, 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 request the governments to uh, to think of uh, you know the possible uh, the, the opportunity to uh, to find uh, uh, the domestic resources. So one of them is the uh, tobacco tax. They can they increase the tax on the tobacco, alcohol, and other sugary uh, uh, SSBs, so, so that you know, that resources can be used. To, Care uh, for any uh, or strengthen the health system, uh, and also for uh, promote awareness at the community. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have already overshot the time by almost seventeen, uh, eighteen minutes. So we now come to the end of today's webinar. We are very grateful to our panelists for an enriching and informative discussion on the importance of health for all. thanks to all the participants also for their active engagement in the question and answer session and as dr richard horton editor in chief of the lancet has said the countries that will be most resilient to covid-19 will be those with the most universal equitable responsive and well financed health systems never have these three simple words health for all meant so much indeed never before so goodbye and stay safe